Who's the best point guard in the NBA? Me. Working against Bradley for three. John Wall. What a pressure shot. That was it. Today that John Wall's left Achilles tendon ruptured, and he's going to be out for at least the next 12 months. Trash. Beyond trash. It's a disgrace taking place in the nation's capital. John Wall came from a world that has two escape routes. Those are in handcuffs or a body bag. By all accounts, John Wall was a hamster in a wheel destined for nothing more than he was born into. From the ages of 2 to 8, his only remembrance of his dad was through prison visitations. His dad was arrested for armed robbery and the second degree murder of a woman during an argument. John became used to the routine of packing the car every Sunday, driving two hours, and spending time with his father. Growing up, he was surrounded by violence, drugs, and for most, this was a dead end road. John's father never wanted this for him. They didn't talk about what he was doing where he was, or anything like that. All that matters was where he was going in the future. It was instilled in him to always be better than what came before you. Two weeks before John's ninth birthday, his father was released from prison. He was diagnosed with terminal liver cancer and was allowed to spend his last days with his family. The family took a beach vacation right before the new school year started, in which was one of John's only real memories with his dad outside of a jail cell. Getting to experience his time with his dad was unforgettable, but for all the wrong reasons. A series of small surgical bands withholding his dad's liver snapped, and he bled out profusely in the hotel bath. The ambulance rushed to the scene and wheeled him out of the room in his Randy Moss jersey that John still keeps to this day, and this was the last that John ever saw his father being announced dead later at the hospital. The loss of his dad hurt everyone, but his brother seemed to be hurt most of all, vowing to be the man of the house from that point on just to be incarcerated one year after that. John seemed to go off the deep end. Some people are dealt cards that are inferior, and that's just who you are. He revolted against everyone and everything. He didn't like the way you were talking to him, he'd crack your jaw. You didn't pass him the ball at practice, he's mouthing off to you. He stole cars, he was shot at on multiple occasions, and once even shot back. John got kicked out of school after school for his behavior, disappointing his mom time after time. She told him frequently he was just like his dad, and he seemingly was. John was seemingly a product of his environment, but one thing he had was some of the most ridiculous God-given athletic ability that I've ever seen. He was cut from the varsity team his sophomore year of high school for attitude-related issues, so he transferred over to Word of God Christian Academy. John was an ultra-talented force with an unreal potential that he really didn't care to reach. His coach told him straight up that the only reason he wasn't getting scouted by major D1 teams was because he's an ass. John was stuck as a what if before he even turned 18. You can be in the streets or you can play to a high level, you can't do both. His mom begged him to focus on the game, but it never really clicked until she used her last $200 to send John to an AAU tournament instead of paying the electric bill. In her dark room, he decided to sacrifice for her the same way she did for him and knew that basketball was the only way out of the hole that he dug himself into. This sparked the emergence of John Wall. He bursted into stardom to a rather unseen level. The hyper-athletic guard built a case for one of the top high school guards we've ever seen. He was ranked number one with 19, 9, and 8 averages his senior year, with probably the greatest high school mix I've ever seen. The guy was not from this planet. He had all-time level athleticism with a sky-high basketball IQ and elite-level defense. It didn't matter where he came from, all that mattered was where he was going. Every coach wanted this guy. The college scene was wide open, he could go wherever he wanted to. Scouted by the University of Kentucky, Duke, Georgia Tech, and the University of Kansas, he had the biggest players in the game looking to hand over the keys to the offense. John saw a few similarities to another star guard just two years ago who took the nation by storm in the Calipari offense, and after Calipari left Memphis for Kentucky, John decided to follow suit creating a college powerhouse with Eric Bledsoe, Patrick Patterson, and Boogie Cousins. This team was one of the most talented college rosters I've ever seen hands down, and John was no doubt the guy running the show. John had generational athleticism that allowed for him to be one of the top transition players to ever play college basketball. He utilized his athleticism phenomenally well too. He could dribble past anyone with both hands when going downhill, was a phenomenal decision maker especially in the full court, could pull up for two, finish with both hands, and had some of the craziest body control I've ever seen. It didn't matter who was on your team. If you had the number one pick, you were going to draft John Wall. It was as simple as that. 
There were a few flaws in his game, but who cared? He relied on his athleticism a bit too much, sometimes making it awkward in the half court, and his spot up shot was a little slow and inconsistent, but his free throw percentage was good enough, and his form was pretty smooth. This guy's floor seemed to be on the fucking moon. He put up 16, 4, and 6 averages this year, sharing the ball with one of the best centers of our generation and another top point guard in the country before being knocked out kind of early in the tournament in the Elite Eight, making them one of the better teams to not win the whole thing. Kentucky's Big Four all hit the draft boards going throughout the early to mid first round, and we all know where John was going. The Wizards landed the first pick in which they used to draft him into a pretty unique situation. They were coming off back-to-back -back shit seasons, in which their star Gilbert Arenas was sidelined due to injuries and, uh, some other stuff. John Wall was the star that the Wizards were banking on leading them out of the Gilbert Arenas era, and hopefully into the J. Wall era. Dude was a killer straight out the gate, in the summer league putting up 23-8-4 with 2.5 steals. It didn't take long for them to decide that Wall was the future of this team. I mean, he put up a stupid 29, 13, and 9 steals in the home opener. They traded arenas after a couple months and rode it out with John, letting him experience the up and downs of leading a team early on in his career. John put up some very decent numbers for a rookie with 16, 8, and 4 averages with 2 steals a game. This guy was the best player in his class, no doubt. He came in second place for Rookie of the Year behind Blake Griffin, who was drafted the year before, but then busted up his knee, kind of similar to the Ben Simmons story. But the wall buzz was real across the league, already catching tons of comparisons to top guards around the league. The Wizards struggled this year, their roster kind of sucked, and they blew their draft pick on Jan Fezzeli. To be honest with you, I have no fucking clue who this guy is, but after further research, he really sucked, so on to the next year, I guess, where John kept the ball rolling. His numbers were consistent across the board to last year, with a slight boost in efficiency, but this was due to him not having the willingness to shoot the three ball. This was definitely his biggest weakness in his game. I mean, he shot under two a game his rookie year, and under one in his sophomore, shooting 30% and 7% respectively, yes, 7% from three. The coaches cut this out of his game, which doesn't make any sense since they sucked big time anyways, and Wall was clearly the light at the end of the tunnel. But after this year, the spacing issue was helped, and the light definitely became a little bigger as the Wizards picked up lights out guard Bradley Beal. This backcourt pairing started to build a top young core around the league for the foreseeable future. John went out with a knee injury in the following preseason, which left the Wizards in a position that they clearly couldn't survive in. I mean, these guys won 5 of 33 games in his absence, that just shows you the value that he had to this team. He definitely didn't lose any steam after his return, in fact he looked even better upping his scoring average to 18, 7, and 4, with nearly a steal and a block a game. John was proving to consistently be one of the top guards in the NBA in transition, when facilitating the offense, and defending. This year he likely would have been an all-star had he been healthy to start the season, and at this point he started to get quite a bit of recognition as a top 10 guard in the league. John had a few doubts in his game at this point, pretty much identical to his concerns in college, and it's debatable that he wasn't developing at the rate that they hoped, but the Wizards bought into the idea that this was their franchise guy, giving him a pretty sweet 5 year $80 million extension. He lived up to his payday for the 2013-2014 season, this was the best wall that we had seen up to this point. Drew's averages are not a big improvement over his rookie year, but he knocked down the 3 ball at a 35% rate on nearly 4 a game. This was big for Wall, and it also helped that he played and started in all 82 games for the Wiz. This combined with Bradley Beal emerging into a very good 3 level scorer, helped the Wizards crack over 30 wins for the first time in Wall's career, but they even stomped on that, finishing at 44 and 38, earning a trip to the playoffs. And these guys turned some heads, man. They beat down on a Joakim Noah-led bold steam, winning in five games. This was the first win in nine years for the Wiz, and it really started to build some hype for the future. John Wall was basically a consensus top five to three-ish point in the league, but won a pretty kick-ass dunk contest and earned his first all-star nod this year, while Bradley Beal was dropping consistent 20 bombs on 40% behind the arc before he could legally drink a beer. They lost in 6 to the PG and Hibbert Pacers in a series that could have swung the other way. I mean, two losses were within 4 points. This could have been a Wizards and Big 3 Heat Eastern Conference Finals in as early as 2014. This team was fun, this backcourt was really cool and at times seemed to mesh incredibly well. Beal complimented Wall's uncomfort shooting the ball, and Wall covered for Beal's defensive woes. They were a bit of a fan favorite, these guys were very exciting. I mean, you never knew what John was going to do next. He could throw down a hammer over top somebody, 
skim by with his infamous 360 fillet, or drop some disgusting no-look beauty to a teammate. And this upcoming year, he jumped in that category as well. The 2015 season was when John went from a very good playmaker and defender to an elite one. He cracked 10 assists for the first time in his career, and earned a spot on the all-defensive second team. His game seemed to be maturing at a pretty linear rate. Really, he was just becoming a smarter player year after year, slowing down and accelerating to make himself more shifty and unpredictable. I mean, he was very D-Rose-esque at this time. This season also marked the peak of John's popularity, I'd say. John was voted as an all-star starter, he was young, and he was starting to put the spotlight on a team that doesn't get to say that too often. But he also gained many supporters, for a much more personal reason. After 26, 7, and a career-high 17 assist performance and a double overtime win, John Wall broke down following the death of his friend, a 6-year-old girl named Maya who was a victim of terminal cancer. This went very viral and showed the kind of guy he was. They ran up a pretty decent 46 wins, which is really solid when taking into account that this was a two-man show. I mean, Marcin Gortat is Marcin Gortat, and Paul Pierce, their offseason pickup, was 37. They really lacked depth on this roster, and that seemed to hold them back quite a bit. They actually babied the Raptors, sweeping the first round in a series where Wall was pretty brilliant at 17, 12 and a half, and 10. But the supporting pieces admittedly picked up the slack. This was a very good team effort. And that's what you need to make a deep playoff run. John Wall was turning average players into threats with his ability to create advantages and capitalize by scoring, kicking out, or dumping off. These hopes were pretty quickly shut down as John would fracture his hand in game one of the following series. This was pretty brutal, he missed three of the six games against the one-seeded Hawks in a series that actually proved to be more entertaining than it should have been. Paul Pierce called game twice in the series before he was a millisecond away from sending it to game seven in which the Wizards probably could have won realistically. Either way, this was unfortunate, but proved to be a good series, no doubt about it. The next year was riddled by Bradley Beal injuries and resulted in a 500 finish, which is pretty wild for a one-man show. Otto Porter was starting to blossom into that third option, but he definitely wasn't there quite yet. This was kind of a waste of a season, and Wall took the time to undergo a procedure on both of his knees in the offseason, which must have done something alright, because outside of LeBron James, John Wall was the best player in the Eastern Conference next year. He filled up the stat sheet at 23, 11, and 4 with two rips a game. I mean, he was one of the most talented guards and overall players I've ever seen. It was unreal the way this guy could fly around with such control. These guys were a tough team at 49 and 33. Otto Porter was a good third option on the wing, who smacked 43% beyond the arc. Markeith Morris was physical and could stretch the floor, and Gortat was starting caliber. These guys were okay, but again, this was the Beal and Wall show. They were great offensive weapons, but they were also basically the only guys who could create, so they had to show up every night. They beat a pretty tough Hawks team in 6 before matching up with the Celtics in a series that will be remembered for quite a while. This was physical as all hell, emotional, and storied. This is primarily remembered for IT putting on a show after his sister's tragic passing, but damn, Wall did not take it easy on him. 25 10 and 3 with nearly two steals and two blocks a game i don't think the wizards had the depth to keep up with the celtics and they truly were just on one in this series the wizards didn't lose they were definitely beat wall had kind of done a lot for these guys up to this point and they compensated him for that giving him a super max for four years worth a crazy 170 million with wall at 27 and beal at 24 this is sadly where the team would start their decline Wall battled continual lower body injuries that nagged him throughout the year, leaving him sidelined for half the season. He played extremely well when he was back, but his absence and lack of consistent help outside of Beal left them out of the playoffs in the first round. They really were just not playing as a unit after this point. Wall and Beal called out their teammates for having their own agenda and really not working as a unit. They had a horrible start to the year and it just got worse and worse. John went out with a heel injury that was going to need surgery and end his season. This unfortunately would go wrong and end up getting infected from the incision. And shortly after that, Wall would tear his Achilles in his own home. This is a kill shot for a player like Wall. You really are not going to play to the same level ever again, especially when you're as reliant on athletic ability as his game is. He was out the entirety of the following year dealing with the injury and things just continued to get worse for him. He lost his mom December 2019 of breast cancer at just 58 years old. He lost his grandmother shortly after that and truly was at the lowest point in his life. 
The world's cruel sometimes, man. Wall's been open about suicidal thoughts he was experiencing during this time, which I couldn't even begin to imagine. Back to basketball and Wall was swapped for Russell Westbrook the following year, landing him in Houston during the James Harden drama. Harden wasn't showing up to camp, was out partying and getting out of shape, and John Wall was left with a bunch of scrubs on this team. They shipped Harden off to Brooklyn and left Wall with the keys to the team after not playing for nearly two years since the injury. It was good to see Wall back at this point, and he really did have some life in his game, with 20-7 and 7 averages. Unfortunately, the Rockets were tanking during this time, and wasting Wall's talents entirely before he went down with a hamstring injury. They wanted Wall to come off the bench the following year, playing 10-15 to 15 a game, and maybe taking a couple DNPs here and there. He wasn't having this at all, being their best player the previous year, and they mutually decided to have Wall sit out the season as his ludicrous contract was untradeable, making $44 million just to sit at home. After a buyout agreement, Wall signed with the Clippers for this current season with a roll off the bench, in which he really did look slow. He was very inefficient, his defense was not really near what it was, and he was traded back to the Rockets and waived just a few weeks ago. This means that we may have seen the last of John Wall's basketball career. In many ways, this was disappointing as one of the most gifted guards we've ever seen, his prime was wasted on a team that couldn't put the pieces in place to lift them into contention, before the eventual destruction of his career due to the ongoing injuries that he suffered. John's fall is disheartening, but his rise to the top was truly something that was nothing short of remarkable. From the lowest of lows to reaching the highest of highs, John Wall's legacy may not be what it could have been, and it's likely that over time he'll likely be a forgotten piece of history only appreciated by those who lived through it, but John Wall reached levels which should have never been possible, and inspired a whole lot of people in the process. Thank you guys for watching if you made it this far, and I'll catch you boys in the next one. Peace out.